knowing that she gave birth to him? Knowing that she watched him grow up? Knowing the Old Testament? Knowing that it was prophesied what was going to happen? He says to do communion in remembrance of me. It doesn't say how often, but it says to do it. If you turn to your Bibles to Acts 2.42, you will find the mandates of our church. A church is not a building, it is a body, it is a people. A people chosen for his purpose, his plan, and for his glory. Acts 2.42. It says, and they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. This is the mandates of the New Testament church. So this morning, as he has commanded us to do, in remembrance of him, is to have communion. The purpose of communion is to examine oneself, to look within. It's the whole purpose for it. Turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 42. says verse 14 I have kept silent for a long time I have kept still and restrained myself flip over to 53 Jesus was not alone on the cross. There were two others. One reminded him that he could free himself. The other one reminded him that he needed him to be free. Imagine that. Without the work that was done that this represents, there would be a barrier between us and God. But because he loved us so much, he sent his son to be tortured, spit on, the Bible says, crushed. Look at 53.1. Isaiah 53.1. Isaiah 53.1. Who has believed our message? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we, as we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. 
the chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. Isn't that where I left us last Sunday? And yet we're here again by his grace to be able to remember what he did. Many went home last night and are face to face with him. But he kept us here this morning for one reason, and that's to glorify him. And as we remember what he did for us, we will then take his teachings that we learn and we will go and we will serve him with all of our heart. Why? Is it because he pays us to do that? Do we love him because he blesses us? Or do we do it because of what he did for us? That is how we examine ourselves to see why do we do what we do? You're here this morning, not because you're paid to be here, not because you're bribed. Well, some of you might be. You're here because you want to be here. You come with a hope that whatever is going to happen within these four walls are going to improve your life. I know you don't come here because it's a social club. It's not. Although we are sociable, but we come here to worship him in spirit and truth and recognizing that he is king, not by what we did or what we do or what we will do, but because of what he did for us. What did you pay for that? What did you do? What was your part in that? But your part is now. Through obedience. Through faithfulness. Through witnessing. Through loving. Through sharing. And through remembering. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, verse 6. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before his shearers. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgments he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant will justify the many, as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many, and interceded for the transgressors. Turn to 1 Corinthians, please. Chapter 11. Starting in verse 1. B. 
Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firm to the traditions, just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of every woman, and God is the head of Christ. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and the same with her whose head is shaved. Go to verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Richard, would you come up here a second? Would you mind distributing? Do this in remembrance of me. Look at verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks in the cup in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat the bread and drink the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, in order that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that he may not come together for judgment, and the remaining matters I shall arrange when I come. It is a custom for us to hold all the elements until everyone is served. Once again, he says, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may partake. And in the same way, verse 25, he took the cup also after supper, supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You may drink. Father God, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for the work that you did on our behalf by sending yourself in the flesh as a substitute, recognizing that we needed a Savior. As your word commands us, we stand before you humble 
knowing that we did not do the work that you did yourself for us. I just ask, Father, that as we think about all the things that you've done for us, that you receive the glory from our praise and worship that comes through our lives. Strengthen us. Prepare us. And as we, as we sing, when I survey the wondrous cross, may we be reminded that all that we do, we do for you. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Things in Christ.
Christ's name, amen. Children, I hear Lillian has something special for you. stay for the teaching. I don't blame her. Are you going to go color? Come on. You don't want to go? <laughs> well, I'm teaching on Jesus Christ. What a topic to teach on. We're continuing on our study of Jesus who is the Son of God, or as some of you might know, God the Son. We covered quite a bit of topics, so I'm not going to review too much because it's on video. But I can tell you one thing's for sure. He was sent with a purpose and a plan. And as we learn from communion, everything that we have is because of Him, and not of our own capabilities. He was called the Son of Man so we could have the capacity to recognize that through his humanity, he would suffer like we did. In order for him to be a true Savior, in order for us to understand and to relate with what he did, he had to be human. He had to be flesh. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to comprehend it. Even the Bible talks about if angels were visible, we would worship them. So he had to come in a way that we could understand. Even the Jews themselves expected him to come differently than he came. But he said, I'm going to come, but not like you expect. And thank goodness he came the way he did, because we can relate with him, can't we? If he came like the king he is, with a big robe and a crown, and we, we could never relate to that, because none of us are kings. Or queens. He came as a man. So that we could relate as a human. During his life on earth, he experienced physical, intellectual, and spiritual growth. He just didn't come brilliant. He could have. He had to learn. He had to grow. He had to lay the path, give us a way to follow, so we could follow him. That's why he says, come, follow me. All throughout the New Testament, come, come, follow me. Come on, let's go, come on, come on, follow, come, here we go, come on. Some said yes, some said no. Free will. We have a choice to come. We have a choice to follow in his footsteps. But when you see the footsteps and you see the direction he went and Peter who watched him go ahead of him and said, oh, wait a second. I don't know if I want to go through that. Yet even the Apostle Paul said, be imitators of me. So Paul said, come on. Follow, I'm going to follow him. Come on with me. And some did, and some didn't. Apostle after apostle after apostle was told to follow, to come. And they did. So that we could follow after them. So we had something to hold on to, to relate with. Relationship 
that word is a very powerful word. It suggests relation and ship, a journey. You go on a ship, you go from one place to another. Our ship and our journey, our relationship, is centered around Jesus Christ and having a relationship with him. Turn with me to Luke, chapter 2. Starting at verse 40. Luke 2, 40. Referring to Jesus Christ and the child... How do I know it's referring to Jesus Christ? Anybody have to rightly divide that in any special language? It's pretty clear. And the child continued to grow. And become strong increasing in wisdom and in the grace and the grace of God was upon him continue to grow and become strong increasing in wisdom as children do we not continue to grow we do we grow mentally we grow physically I was five foot six at 17, and in one summer I grew eight inches, and did it hurt? My knees were, I was, my dad went clothes shopping before summer, and when summer came, I went to school like this, no choice. It was very embarrassing. This wasn't in style, now it is. I wish it was back then. But it hurt. Growth hurts. I can tell you firsthand how every time I had to go up a pant size, how much it hurts. But because his grace is sufficient, he makes bigger pants. He makes more lessons. He gives us more opportunities to learn from our mistakes and to learn from everything that we would have wisdom. The world wants to convince you that the world knows what's best for you. But God has better plans than that. That's what wisdom is. Wisdom gives you the opportunity to take experience with knowledge and put it together. That's wisdom. And he continued to grow in wisdom. Did it mean become strong just physically? I mean, how many times do we see Jesus and he's absolutely bone upon bone and skinny and feeble? And I want to see a feeble man turn over a table of gold and tell me how easy that is. I want to see how a feeble, skinny little man can carry a cross after being beaten to practically death if he's so skinny and scrawny. Now, we can argue about how big he was. We can argue about what color he is. We can argue about what he looked like. But does it really matter? No. The fact is, he had to grow. And as an example, to watch someone grow and to watch someone go through what he went through and then to see that and go, wow, I don't think I could do that, gives you a humility that you're not born with. It's wi it, the wisdom of learning from what we read and what we see gives us a wisdom beyond understanding. If you look at 52, 252. 
And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Jesus knew fatigue, just like we know fatigue. Look at John, chapter 4. Starting at verse 6. starts off and Jacob's well was there. But Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. Weary from his journey. Do you know how far... Did Jesus come with a car? No. He, he had a donkey. Did he ride the donkey everywhere? No. He walked a lot. I wonder if we ever calculated, has anybody ever calculated how long Jesus walked? 33 years. Or maybe 30. Two and three quarter. <laughs> but he wearied, he tired. We know from reading other passages, he was sleeping on a boat. We know that he was also deity because he was God, because he's God. We read that, we studied that in the first part. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. I didn't write it, I just read it. It doesn't take a, a, a theologian to put that together, it's pretty clear. He was hungry. Turn to Matthew. Chapter 4. See, you might not know these things. You might get into an argument. Oh, I'm sorry, a discussion. An argument. With someone. Oh, well, Jesus was God, so he could deal with it. But he didn't use his deity in that way. He was humanity. He was human. He was 100% man and 100% God. Matthew 4, 2. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. That's how we know he was hungry because it says he was hungry. <laughs> I love it when it's so clear, isn't it? It's so clear. Knowing that Jesus was hungry, I know it doesn't change your life. I know that's not very impactful. But the fact is, is have you ever fasted for 40 days? I haven't either. Not four days. I think I fasted once for like 48 hours and whined and complained and, oh, I'm starving. Why is it important to know that he was fatigued? Why is it important to know that he was hungry? So that we can recognize that what he went through and what we're going through, he went through it worse. Have you ever had that relative who you mentioned you have a sore leg? and Well, let me tell you about my hip. My goodness, you can battle for hours over this. Even if you just sit in a room with anyone over 45, you'll have this conversation. The young ones, they don't complain about that stuff. They complain about money and everything else. But you get to that 40, 50 age, all of a sudden, discussions become bodily function issues. <laughs> Jesus says, I get it. I understand. That's my only point. I'm not going to go any further on that. We can laugh and I can make jokes for hours on that. But he was hungry. Turn to John 19. He thirsted. Thir thirsted. He thirsted.
He was thirsty. Verses 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I am thirsty. It's so clear. Who here has gone through something really stressful in the last two weeks? The last month? The last year? Been a rough year? Notice I haven't put my hand down yet. I cannot honestly say there hasn't been a time that I haven't been tested in some way, shape, or form. Some go through things more than someone else. Some are physical, some are mental, many are spiritual. But think about that situation that just popped in your mind. You know that one that doesn't seem to go away, that keeps you up at night, that keeps irritating you, that God hasn't answered yet and you're waiting? You either hear a yes, a no, or a wait. I don't like the wait one. I like yes or no, man. Be clear and cut. Don't take all this time and stretch it out so I've got to wait and not know what's going on. I'm sitting in the courtroom. And every time I'm in the courtroom, my nerves are shot. The night before, sleeping is very difficult. I should know by now to bring about 1,700 rolls of toilet paper the night before court because my stomach is messed up. Is it because I think God's not in control? No, it's I fear because I know he's in control. (laughs) And I know based upon past experiences that the decisions that have been made were not very favorable to me. And I take it personally because it affects my life. But it's through those situations that I, while I was gone, good things happened this time. And I was reminded that even when the bad things happen and the greatest tests come, I still praise him. I question him, but I praise him. I have a right to question him. Is it right to question him? No, but I have a right to question him because I don't understand. I don't know what your will is in that situation. I know what my will is. Come on, give me what I want. Not just yet. There's a lesson to be learned. Jesus himself was tested. And I'm sure. So others could see. Remember when he he sweated? He, He had so much perspiration that it was like blood. It was so thick. That showed me that there was something on his mind. He saw what was about to happen. Did he see what happened before? Uh Uh-huh, he knew. But he wanted us to know that his humanity could sweat. If that wasn't in there, then I would have a hard time trying to justify my erratic behavior when things go bad. But because he sweated blood, like blood, thick, thick sweat. Theologians have argued for centuries on the thickness of the sweat. Goodness, what does it matter? He was free. He, he, would, he saw what was going to happen to him, and his humanity recognized that it wasn't going to be painless, but was going to be painful. If you know that what you're going to go through is going to hurt, like if you know, like you know a situation, you know the outcome, you know it's coming, you've seen it, and it comes, and it hurts. You got through it, didn't you? It might have been painful. But look here. Look at Hebrews 4.
verse 15. Again, this is the Bible. I take it for as it says. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. We've read before about Jesus' temptations. His conversation with the devil. And all that the devil was offering him. If the devil is so smart, if he's so slick and he's so brilliant, as many have given him the glory on, why didn't he know that Jesus was going to bring him back scripture? Why would he make an offer if he knew Scripture like everyone claims he knows? Just because he believed, doesn't he, we, we don't know what he believed, but we know he believed. But if he's so smart and he's so brilliant, how could he make such a silly offer to Jesus Christ and not know what Jesus was going to say? Because he's not omniscient. He wants to be like God, but he is not God. I'm, I'm getting like you now, Richard. <laughs> he didn't know. Just like he didn't know that when God asked him, Satan, where have you been? Satan should have said, well, you know where I've been. You're God. But he didn't. He answered, oh, I've been on the earth roaming to and fro. He's like a ro roaring lion, seeking to destroy but even during the most greatest temptations that Je do you think that those temptations that Jesus had from Satan were the greatest temptations he had? No way. Have you come up face to face with the devil personally? I know I feel like I did last week, but I didn't. <laughs> it wasn't the devil, just one of his minions, one of his servants, one of his slaves doing his work, doing the work of the little father, the little F, while I do the work of the big F. It was amazing, Judy. I saw a change in the middle of the situation that I've never seen before. The moment it was mentioned that I gave up a good paying job to go work for a church to make peanuts, the whole thing changed. The judge didn't say, why did you do that? Don't you know you have a responsibility? No. But the one next to me who was doing the work of the little F said, well, don't you know that? I mean, said it exactly. I was like, and the judge didn't say a word about it. All of a sudden, the tide changed. Now, it shifted to the other side. For the first time did I ever see that quickly something like that happen. Now I know I'm kind of being gray. I'm not being very black and white like I normally am because those details are irrelevant. The point is, is that if you understand temptation, if you understand that trials and temptations are used to help you grow, then you won't fear them. You will resist them. James 4, 7. Resist, and he will flee. It's hard to resist sometimes, because what glitters is gold. What we think is what God's will is, what seems to be the right decision, might not be. But he knows. That's why he wants you to come to him, because he has the answer. He says, come to me, all who are strong and courageous. No. All who are tired and weary, and I will give you rest. Because he knows. 
Go to Hebrews 2. In the future, I don't know when, this probably would have been a good time, but I'm not prepared for it, so I can't. There was a lesson on suffering. I don't know where this came from, but somewhere in church history, and I haven't done the research, but I will when the time comes, I'll have it for you. Somewhere as Christians, we were taught that we deserved VIP treatment. I don't know where that started. But for some reason, we were taught over history that when we become saved, that all of a sudden everything is fine and great. That's completely against the Bible in every way, shape, or form. I have over 61 verses that say differently. But yet, because we are a child of God now, oh, we're going to have it great. If that was true, then what is there hope in looking forward? <laughs> Why would there need to be a, 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 an opportunity to remove tears, to remove sorrow, to remove pain, if everything is supposed to be great? I know, we want it great. We do, don't we? We want a great life. We want to have everything we want. Well, okay, and some of us get it. I got the greatest wife in history. You can argue with me all you want, but if you knew, you'd see. We have so many great things, don't we? Yet we spend more time focusing on what we don't have instead of what we have. Today, that's right now, Right now, today, even now, is a gift from God. Remember to thank Him. Can I get personal for a moment? I'm glad you came. I know you didn't have to, but I'm glad you came. And I hope somewhere in this message, you get hope from it. Okay? You didn't have to come. He brought you here for a reason. To encourage you, to let you know that it's going to be okay. Whatever it is. See, it's none of my business. As a pastor, and as you know, many pastors, what do they do? They check you. How you doing today? You all right? Are you living right? Are you dressed okay? How you doing? All right, you better be right and right. Are you what 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 translation is that? That's not authorized. <laughs> I'm not poking fun, I'm being serious. I have a friend in Chicago who I went to see who was concerned that I was going to, because I'm a pastor now, that I was going to tell him how to live his life. I can't find anywhere where it's our job to get into your business. My job is to study, inhale, and deliver. Jesus is the only one who had the right to say, stop doing what you're doing and sin no more. But for some reason, because of a few scriptures in the Bible, that if you looked at their original languages, go rebuke your brother. I rebuke you for what you're doing. Man. Or you could say, you know, have you considered that Maybe what you did probably wasn't a good idea. Like they didn't think of that already. We have a right to encourage one another and to say what you're doing is not right. But we have to be careful. Because if we do it out of love, it's wrong. But if we do it in love, what happens? They think about it. They consider it. So Jesus gives us the ability to look at our situation and say, okay, well, have you been down here before? Do you understand what this is like? Because if you do understand, then I know that I can trust in you. We've all been condemned for doing something since we all fall short of his glory. We all. If you say you do not sin, you're a liar. You make God a liar. 
What a wonderful opportunity we have to live a life open and honest before God so that the others that are watching us do the same thing. Have you ever seen someone steal something? Did you tell on them? Have you ever seen someone steal something and then go right behind and steal something else too? Just watch television whenever there's a riot in L.A. Thousands do it. Well, it's okay for him to do it. I'm going to do it. I can't find where following that example is what Jesus did. He says, do not judge or you'll be judged. But we judge. We condemn. We put down. I absolutely can guarantee you that if a person who was homosexual walked in this room and had a shirt saying, I'm homosexual, you would have darts of judgment. It's in you. You've been wired to do that. Or if a murderer came in and said, I'm a murderer, or if out in front of your house it says you're a predator, you would judge. We've been taught to judge. He tells us not to judge, but it's hard. If, if an old man walks in with a pair of shorts and black socks, <laughs> you judge. Doesn't anybody know that that's wrong? Where? Did they, or if you wear white on Easter, what is that rule about? Ladies, help me out here. No white after Labor Day. No, uh? after Labor no white after Labor Day. No white after Labor Day. Uh, Dan, can you help me out here, brother? Um, any idea where that is? I know Jesus must have said it somewhere. No white after Labor Day. You see, now I do have a point on this. It isn't that I'll wear white after Labor Day because I just don't know better. Forgive me for I do not know. Jesus did say that, right? What a wonderful example we have. Did, is Labor Day already been? No, it's in September. Oh, oh. Grace. We're okay. Is there any other rules that we need to understand that before? How about like anything after Memorial Day? That's when you start wearing one. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> according to Emily Post. The Bible according to Emily Post. Uh, the sixth gospel. <laughs> Hebrews 2, 18 tells us that, that Jesus wore white after Labor Day. He did, doesn't, didn't say that. It says, For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Does it say who are only tempted with sexual desires or only tempted who wears white after Labor Day? No, it says who are tempted. He is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. If you have not ever been tempted, raise your hand. He's ready to come to our aid at any time. Turn to Luke 23. Starting in verse 46. Are you afraid of dying? Does death scare you? If it does, then that says that you don't understand death. But Jesus understands death. How do we know? Because we watched a representation of his passing. 
Luke 23, 46 is very clear. It says in Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. <coughs> Turn to Psalm 31. Starting at verse 5. David wrote this way before this was said in the future. Into thy hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast ransomed me, O Lord God of truth. We have been ransomed. By the God of truth. It says you shall know the truth. And the truth. Shall make you free. Or shall set you free. Yet for some reason. As humans. As flesh. We seek after things that are not true and we get put into bondage and don't know why has someone ever lied to you and has their lie put you in bondage I can't think of one time that truth has ever put me in bondage It sets us free. Does it set us free because of what we did? Or what we do? No. It's what Jesus did. He said, these things have been written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. And by believing in him, you would have eternal life. John says, I give eternal life. Jesus Christ gives us eternal life. And that we would never perish. And no one can ever snatch us out of his hands. That truth is what sets us free. But if you add to it, you get put into bondage. Try it sometime. Add to truth and watch what happens you'll get put into bondage. That's part two of the teaching of Jesus. We have more parts, more things. We have to... Uh... This morning in our Sunday school class, we did bracelets of the colors for Jesus. And the black, can you hold your black up, Adrian? The black represents sin. The red represents the blood of Jesus. The white what does it represent? It represents the forgiveness of Jesus. Okay. Ben, Juliet, you want to do the blue? Yeah. Blue represents our water baptism. The sign of our faith in Jesus. Okay. Ready? You want to do the next one? The green? Green represents our new love as we grow in love in our love for Jesus Christ. Juliet, you want to do the Gold represents heaven where we will go some day to be with Jesus if we believe in him. The Bible says that the heavenly city and its streets are made of pure gold. And the gold and the clear Holds the bracelet in a circle, representing our eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. If you've never, to this point, 
have accepted the work that was done, it's yours, it's free. You don't have to do anything for it, but believe. You have that right. You have that right to reject it. We will all stand before God, and when we stand before God, He's going to open up the book of life. And your name is either going to be in it or it's not. I can absolutely guarantee you that your name will not be in it because of how much you gave. I can believe with full confidence that your name will not be in it or not be in it because of what you might have failed. The only way that your name cannot be in that book is by rejecting that Jesus is the Christ. That's what the Bible says. And we all have been given the same opportunity to accept that truth. Now, once you accept that truth, you have a responsibility. And that responsibility is to grow in His grace and in the knowledge of Jesus. That's what we did today, was to help you grow. If you've been with us since the beginning, since February of this year, you have watched a very important process be laid out to help you build a foundation in Christ. One man has been there since almost the very beginning in February. And that man was given an opportunity to teach you. And what's amazing, she wants to come and see, oh, you want to come and see me? You want to come and see me? Come on. Give me five. No, give me five. She blessed us last week, didn't she? But God, because of circumstances, sorry, I, I was not able to come Wednesday to teach you. But through the Holy Spirit, His power made available Richard to teach us. It is God that has chosen your new associate pastor. And all I'm doing is acknowledging it. Right. Now as you know, it hasn't been easy. You've been rejected. You've been told you can't do it, right? But not here. You know why you haven't been told that here? Because God created this ministry. And God will do whatever He wants in this ministry. And He has called you when He says go, to go. And God said go, and you said okay. And you came here and you did an amazing job. What blessed me personally is your acknowledgement of the work of the Holy Spirit. He said, and you'll see if you weren't here Wednesday... You'll see it online in the next 24 hours, God willing. He said, and God has to get the glory on this, not me, but this confirmed the calling on this church that I haven't quit at all. No matter what's happened, I kept going. Why? I gave up my job. Why? For you. Not for us. Goodness gracious, that wasn't the most popular decision, I assure you. But it was what God wanted. And we do what God tells us to do. And when God calls me to go to Chicago or wherever God says to go, we go. But this man gave his heart and soul on Wednesday. And when he said, I had no idea how hard it was. <laughs> this is just the beginning. You haven't seen it. It's not going to be rosy, brother. Well, let me tell you something. The benefits are unbelievable. When you see the people that you teach on Facebook get attacked and they come back with scripture and defend the faith that they live for, that's the greatest price. It's the greatest thing as a payment that as pastors we get is by seeing you apply what we teach you. Continue to grow in His grace. Continue to learn from your mistakes. Don't stop. When people tell you to do something different, ignore them. 
ready to grow more? Yep. I'm giving you some books. One's called The Divine Outline of History. It is a theological book that will teach you all about the church history. It's not very large, but boy, it's going to take you a while to get through it. It's going to bless you. I'm giving these two other. This one I bet you've already read, haven't you? What's it called? Christian love. Yeah. <laughs> the shower of Christian love. What we do up here, if it's not centered in love, is useless. Exactly. Now, that's not the only promotion that's happened at this church. So God's provided a pastor. He's provided an associate pastor. He's provided a children's teacher. He's provided someone who specializes in sign language for those that can't hear. He's provided servants. There's a meaning for my madness, I promise. I know you don't want to get up there, s'mores, but you have to. He's provided a mother. You know you are like the mother of our church. Not like a Catholic mother, <laughs> not like that. But he's provided an encourager. That's what you do. That's your gift. Besides the wonderful corn that you bring. I'd ask you to stand up there, but I doubt you will. Will you? this. Now those of you that are sitting there, guess what? I don't know what gift he has in you and I don't know if he uses it here forever. I can only hope that you never leave and you stay and you serve with us. But if God, wherever God calls you to go, wherever it is from here on out, if it's here for a week, a month, a year, ten years, we are not quitting for nothing. And no one can tell us to. No one. There is no denomination that can wrap their hands around this church and shake it and say, no, nope, you're doing it wrong. There's only one, God. And I want you, the reason why I wanted you guys up here, because Richard said it. He said it Wednesday. He said, this place is not ordinary. Thank goodness. But it's real. That's what makes Sparta Bible Church Sparta Bible Church. And I can never thank you enough for your dedication. As little or as much as it is. We can never be without it. You are the core. That God has brought. 
You have been through good times and you've been through bad times. You drive all the way from all good. And we have an opportunity to glorify the Father through our service to them. And whoever else he brings. And I know that Wednesday, when Richard got up and started, you were just as shocked as I was. Because he's kind of a quiet guy. But boy, you get him behind a pulpit and the Pentecostal comes out of him like you've never seen. He had more energy than me. I was like, praise God. And what an honor to have someone with that much energy take my space. It's hard to fill these pants, brother. It's not easy. These shoes are pretty extreme and pretty Yankee. But by God's grace, you came up and you taught them a wonderful message and an encouragement. And today, as we leave this building, not knowing what tomorrow's going to hold, we're paid up for two more weeks, okay? We have money in the bank. We have money for missionaries. We have money for benevolence. We have money for the building. God has provided everything we've needed. And I don't know what's going to happen next week. Except Christ might come back. Here, you want a pen? You want color? I know, you're supposed to have a crayon. I'm wearing white after Labor Day. Go ahead. Here. Thank you for coming today. I can speak on behalf of these people behind me. That we love what we do. And we do what we love. And that's why we come here. Yes? We're going to pray. You want this? You want to help me pray? We're going to pray and then we'll finish this service. You want to come and pray? Come on. Let's pray. Come here, John. Come here, guys. Come here. Come over here. See, tradition isn't going to bury them. I guarantee it. They have been set free from tradition. Isn't it wonderful? You guys ready to pray? Okay. Here we go. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this service. We thank you for this time. We thank you for all that you've given us and just ask that you continue to strengthen us and guide us. And we look forward to see what you have planned for Wednesday night. We love you so very much. Give us journey mercies as we make our way today. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.